two experienced politicians, Marilyn Lee and Laura Jeep Matsumoto, are in the running for the newly redistricted State House District 38, which covers Mililani and YPO Acres. What fresh new ideas do they have for the district? Plus two political newcomers, Kirsten Kahaloa and Jonathan Keneally, are looking to represent West Hawaii in the race for State House District 6. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Elena Hugh. Tonight, we're speaking to candidates looking to hold a seat in the Hawaii State House. First, we focus on the race for District 38 that includes part of Mililani and Waipio Acres on Oahu. Starting this year, due to reapportionment, the boundaries of the district have changed, pitting two seasoned lawmakers against each other. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email or call us with your questions. We also encourage you to get involved with the conversation over on our Facebook page. Now on to our guests. Democrat Marilyn Lee is a member of the Mililani Neighborhood Board. She previously served in the State House of Representatives from 1996 to 2012, where she served as Majority Floor Leader for four years. Republican Lauren Cheap Matsumoto has served in the State House since 2012, representing District 45, which covered Mililani and Mililani Mauka until the area was reapportioned this year. She serves as Minority Floor Leader in the House. Welcome, thank you for joining us this evening. My first question is for you, Marilyn. Uh, what kind of fresh and new ideas will you bring to the table this year, if elected? Well, first, thank you for having us tonight. We really appreciate the publicity and, and the getting to know the people in the district. But uh, actually, fresh ideas, it's hard to find a fresh idea these days, but one of my real concerns is um, aerospace. And I think aerospace is a wonderful idea to bring to the community and to the state. And now we're having the, the UH involved in the, the shot to, uh, that, was, that occurred the other day. So aerospace and, aero and tourism, space tourism, I think would be a wonderful thing to bring not only to the community, but to the state. Thank you. And Lauren? I think something that is really important is accountability in our legislature. And something that I've introduced and I'm really passionate about is having a financial database over the entire state. So that way there is transparency of where our money is being spent. Right now, all of our departments operate on different systems. And it's, so it's so difficult to know where our taxpayer money is going. So I know it's not the most fun or interesting of ideas, but it's so important to make sure that we're managing taxpayer money well. And Marilyn, back to you. What would you say is the most concerning issue that you're hearing from constituents and from residents as you are going to door to door and, and speaking to them? Well, as I go door to door, it's amazing that most people are really very happy to be living in Mililani Town and in Mililani Mauka. And I don't blame them because it's a great place to live. But people do have concerns about the economy. People have concerns about crime. And people have a lot of concerns about traffic and also red light running um, on some of the main intersection in town. All right, thank you. And Lauren? I am so blessed to have been born and raised in Mililani. And when talking to people, the number one issue that they talk about is the cost of living. And so that's something that I've been passionate about really looking into for the last 10 years that I've been in the legislature. And so the first area that I think we really need to address is eliminating the general excise tax on food and medical services and feminine hygiene products. This is something that would immediately help our families, especially with the high inflation that we have now. The second thing that I think we need to do is to eliminate the income tax for our minimum wage earners and for those in the middle class. We have one of the highest tax rates in the entire country. And so being able to have more money in your pocket would immediately help people. And also addressing home ownership and affordable housing. So those are the things that I hear when going door to door and when doing town halls and doing surveys in the community is really the cost of living is the number one issue for people. All right, and we have uh, a lot of questions already. So thank you everybody for contributing to the conversation. We will try to get to as many as possible. Um, Logan from uh, via email 
email is from Mililani High School, and he wants to know what do you feel needs to be done for education in our state? This is such an important issue. I am a young mother. I have a five-year-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old, so something that I'm looking at all the time, and I am a graduate of uh, Mililani High School. And so something that needs to be done, I think, is really looking at educating the whole child. So often these classes have been cut, like career and technical education, looking at things like physical education. So many of our schools don't have that anymore, and it's just about the standardized tests. So I really think we need to look at educating the whole child and making sure we're looking at different learning styles. And Marilyn, what do you feel needs to be done for education in our state? Well, I've been very active in the schools for a long time. Uh, my children all attended Mililani schools, and I'm on the school community council at Mililani High School. One of the big things, and this is a national issue as well, is learning loss during the pandemic. And this is something that's going to affect a next whole generation of young people if we don't do something about it. So learning loss. And the other big issue is social and emotional learning. Lots of the children were isolated during the pandemic and they need something to help them get back into the swing of things. They need a lot of psychological help. And the other day we had an article in the paper about the lack of school psychologists. So I'd like to see more school psychologists. Thank you. Uh, one of our viewers called in and Lauren, she says, what can be done for families with young children struggling with childcare? This is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Like I mentioned, I have a five-year-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old, and both of my children are in preschool right now. And the cost of preschool is just astronomical. At one point, I was paying $30,000 a year for two children to attend preschool, and that, that's pretty much an annual salary once you take away the taxes. And so I think it's something that we really need to address. So I've introduced bills in the legislature, to, for instance, to have businesses get a tax credit if they provide childcare at their facility, or really working on certification for our preschool teachers. We don't have enough preschool teachers. At one point, I was number 50th on the wait list to get my son into preschool. So there really is a supply issue. And so I was a chair of Women in Government. It's a national organization. And at one of our conferences, we really looked into early childhood education, and they did a case study on Georgia and New Jersey. And they were, New Jersey spent three times the amount that Georgia did per student, but their outcomes were the same. And the difference really came in is looking at a mixed delivery system, meaning not just public preschool, but public, private, and home-based preschool, so that there is an increased supply. And that's something that I think we really need to do here in Hawaii, and it will help to lower the cost. And Marilyn, what do you I, think? I agree that, that um, child care is extremely important. I now have nine grandchildren and four children, and I still have very young grandchildren in the family. And all of my children struggle with the issue of child care. And the cost is just out of sight. The other reason that it's out of sight and, uh, is that it, there are all these safety issues related to, to caring for young children. And then, uh, unfortunately, the preschool teachers are not paid enough. They're, you know, they're very low paid for the kind of responsibility they have. So I couldn't agree more with, with Lauren. It's, it's a big problem. And you know, some children are being taken to unlicensed care, and that's sometimes a tragedy because they're kind of placed in front of the TV set and you know, to keep them quiet. And um, that's not the way that young children should be treated. Desperate times call for desperate measures Absolutely. for some. Do you think there should be term limits for state legislators? Um, term limits are a good idea, but I don't think that the majority of legislators would be voting in favor of it. And we actually do have, this year, a lot of people are gonna be leaving the legislature. I don't know exactly how many, but there are quite a few that are really leaving. And so you, we sort of have a natural kind of um, term limit when people go off to run for higher office or, or decide that, that they want to leave the state or, you know, which has happened this year. But I, you know, I, I think that, you know, I've had a 10 year uh, uh, respite between my, um, the end of my last term and, and now. So I feel that I don't really need to have, be limited in a term now. It'll be probably limited by my age, but, um, 
you know, it's going to be a difficult thing to accept because we do need the experienced people. We also need to, to think about the young people like Lauren to have their opportunities to serve. Lauren, what do you think? I have always strongly supported term limits. I think that's something that's really important to make sure that we're bringing in new, fresh ideas, that we don't have people who are in office for so long. If you're serving with all of your heart and really putting everything into it, it's, it is a full-time commitment. And so I think making sure that we're able to really have the best legislators that we can. Again, it takes a little while to learn what you're doing, but to have those term limits, I think it'll help with the issue of corruption that we've had. We've had so many people indicted in the last year. And so I think term limits is a solution to some of those issues. All right. Um, I don't Lauren. think the length of time you're mm -hmm. in office um, has any relationship to, to whether you're uh, corrupt or not, but uh, that's my opinion. <laughs> um, Sarah writes in via email, it's so hard to buy a house in Hawaii. What is your plan to help people in our state afford a home? This is a top issue with cost of living, home ownership comes right there with it. And I think in the legislature so often we talk about affordable rentals, which is really a good idea. But what I think we need to focus on is home ownership. And so an issue that I've been working on is I've introduced a bill so that we can have really bifurcate the market and have a local housing market. We have so many foreign investors coming in and locals are just not able to afford a home. And so being able to bifurcate the market is the first step. And the other thing when talking with people, one of the biggest hurdles to being able to buy a home is that down payment and being able to save enough for that down payment. And so another bill that I've introduced is to have a pre-tax savings plan, very similar to like island flex spending where you have dependent care or you can have pre-tax dollars for medical services, that you can have a third of your money back in order to save up for that down payment. Because once we're able to lock in to a mortgage, as people get um, raises and as they are able to earn more money, their mortgage is fixed, and that's able to help lift everybody up. It's able to help them have more disposable income and really to invest in their family. And Marilyn. Uh, can you repeat the question? Um, it's so hard to buy a house in Hawaii. What's your plan to help people in our state afford a home? Okay. Well, the first, in the first place, I think we're going to have to look at smaller homes and different ways of living maybe shared uh, apartments that have shared like cooking facilities and laundry facilities because there's just not enough land to put single family houses on in Hawaii um, without really using all the agricultural land up. So we do have to look at the different options and it is a shame that not everybody can be a homeowner but rental is not a bad idea for a few years and actually rent to own is something that I think we ought to think about. Where, you know, kind of like rent to own furniture, rent to own a house, and as you put the equity in there, you eventually um, end up with a down payment and you go on to own the house. You know, you did bring up a little bit about agriculture. What are your thoughts about, you know, the current state of agriculture within your district? Well, we have, um, we have a lot of agricultural land, especially in between Milwaukee and the North Shore. And so far, a lot of that land has not been developed. Um, the pineapple land, of course, pineapple has kind of gone out as, as a cash crop, but there's a lot that can be done in terms of agriculture. And I'm a big supporter of ulu, or breadfruit, for those who don't understand the word. Um, it's such a, a, a crop that's sustainable and is full of protein, and it would be a wonderful thing to be able to uh, help the people understand and use as a staple food. So also the community gardens are a wonderful thing too. We have a community garden at my church in Milani. I have two plots there and uh, we have 60 people with little plots there at the community garden. And every uh, week or so we give to either homeless or elderly or people in need in the community. So um, agriculture can be either small in your backyard or big. Uh, growing an ulu tree out in the plantation. But I think there's so much potential for it. Yes, ulu, very diverse also. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, Lauren, what is your plan as far as agriculture and agricultural lands? 
This issue is so near and dear to my heart. My family has Peterson's Egg Farm in Wahiwa. My great-grandfather started it in 1910, and my mom is the one who runs the farm now, so I've grown up in a farming family. And actually, when I first got elected in 2012, I was the only person in the legislature at the time who had ever lived or worked on a farm. And so bringing in that experience is so important. And what I've seen in my time in the legislature is a lot of the laws that we pass really put burdens on our small farmers without even realizing it. Some of the business laws we've passed, some of the tax laws that we've passed, some of the buffer zone laws that we've passed really are putting a lot of our small farmers out of business. And so what's so difficult is farmers don't have the time to come and testify. And so I'm so happy that we have remote testimony now because they're able to act, not have to leave their farm and sit at the Capitol for hours, and they're able to give their input at the Capitol. But what the state really needs to focus on, in my opinion, is really infrastructure, water and electricity, because those are the biggest costs of getting your farm up and running. I did represent those agricultural lands between Mililani and the North Shore in my time in the legislature. And one of our farmers, when they were getting started, in order to dig a well, it was costing them almost a million dollars. And that's just for water. That's not talking about your buildings. That's not talking about even getting your crops going. And so I think what the state can really do to aid in food production is working on infrastructure so we can support our local farmers. All right. We haven't uh, made use of the Galbraith lands, which we saved when I was still in the legislature. And the problem with those lands is, is some of the, there aren't many people who want to go into farming these days. And so we need to do something about making agriculture a, a more attractive field to enter. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that it, if the community colleges got more active in agricultural areas, that that would be a good thing as well. Uh, Lauren, obviously being in the minority currently, mm -hmm. uh, we also have a comment from Jason from Mililani. He says, since Hawaii's le legislature is predominantly democratic, what are the pros and cons of one party control? The pros, hmm. Uh, the pros of one party control, maybe that you, you get committee, you get to be a committee chair, you have a lot of bills passed through. Um, but I think in my time in the legislature, I have seen that there's a lot of difficulties and there's issues with having one party rule. 94% of our elected officials are all from one party in our state. And I've been able to see firsthand how bills just pass through the legislature, that there's not really a culture of conversation. And so I think that's something that really needs to change. And I know people can argue that, you know, even people in the majority party, they have different opinions, there's different factions, but ultimately it really is one power structure, right? And sometimes not wanting to speak up because you don't want to lose your, your chair. But I think what's so important and what I've gotten to learn about being in the minority is really how to be collaborative and work together to get things done. And I think that that's something that's missing in our state, but also across the nation. And so I think balance is something that's really important in our state so all the voices in Hawaii can be heard. Thank you. And uh, since Hawaii's legislator, le legislature is predominantly democratic, what are the pros and the cons of one party control? Well, certainly it's good to have a balance. And, but it's not the fault of the Democratic Party that we have so few Republicans. So I think in the future that the Republicans need to work harder to get attractive candidates. And the Republican Party nationally it has so many negatives these days that I think it's really hard for a lot of people to really um, vote Republican. I mean, look at the, the recent Roe decision. Uh, we've lost all our reproductive rights if the new Congress is all Republican, they will pass a bill that makes a, a national ban against uh, reproductive rights. And so I think if the Republican Party had people that were more interested in the rights of women, for instance, and in the rights of voters, that we'd be in better shape. We have several questions in regards to food security from Hannah and Jen. Um, how would you suggest we ensure food security for Hawaii? Oh, that's a good question. Well, as I mentioned, ooh, <laughs> uh, there, it, I think that's, it's a very important um, subject. And I think 
one of the, the things that we need to encourage people to do is to buy local and to, to also shop at local establishments and, and as much as possible kind of avoid the big box places because all the money that's made there is going off to the mainland. And um, but we need to really develop our agricultural crops, not only for local uh, um, consumption, but also to export. And with Ulu, you actually can um, make all kinds of products from it. So um, but we want people to be well nourished. And you can use that like you would a potato. It's got lots of protein in it. So food security is probably at the top of my list because we have a big storm. We're going to be stuck out here in the middle of the ocean without any food to eat if we don't really get on the horse and to ride it back to uh, community gardens and farming. And Lauren? Food security is so important. I mean, we hear the statistic all the time that we import 85 to 90 percent of our food. So it's so essential that we grow food here and again, support our small local farmers. And I think one of the big things that we need to focus on is a lot of our farmers are really, really good at farming, but business is where they struggle. And so a lot of times we have so many people growing lettuce and tomato and cucumber but there isn't necessarily enough of a demand for those types of things. And so when I've been in the legislature, I've been working with CTAR, with the University of Hawaii, to help create some of those business plans for our farmers to be able to know what are the crops that they should be growing, what are the best things to be doing. And the other thing is, as a farmer, you often, if you're selling to a store, you only get 10 cents on the dollar. And so you have very razor thin margins. And so another thing that we're working on is food hubs. So a lot of these small, farmers can have one central processing plant so that their costs go down and they're able to earn more. And the other area is ag tech, making sure like it's difficult for people to want to farm. There are ways that we can modernize agriculture in order to produce food and make sure that we actually have a smaller footprint and can grow more. Mm, okay, um, let's switch gears a little bit. You know, obviously our number one industry in the state is tourism. What kind of ideas do you have to diversify our economy? I think this was really put into light during the pandemic that we cannot just be dependent on tourism. And so we need to diversify now and the sectors that I think we should go into are film, tech, and agriculture. So our film industry, I feel, is underutilized here in Hawaii. It is an already existing industry that we can really focus on to build our economy. The University of Hawaii has the Academy for Creative Media. They're just about to open their brand new state-of-the-art facility out in West Oahu this November. And so we're able to have the educational background to have our students ready to enter that field as well. So being able to get high-paying jobs. And for tech, Hawaii is the epicenter between Asia and the mainland. We are perfectly poised to have a strong tech, center, tech sector that would also be very high paying jobs with a really small footprint and something that our local community can really look forward to so they can stay here in Hawaii with those high paying jobs. And you already talked about agriculture, Ag so yes. I'm gonna toss it over to Marilyn. <laughs> uh, how do you plan to diversify? Okay, well, I already did mention aerospace because I think that's something that's really for the future of Hawaii, given our uh, location in the middle of the Pacific, and also all those um, wonderful students we're training for, with, with STEM. But um, I'd like to see also a, a greater emphasis on astronomy. I'm a big supporter of TMT, and I'm hoping that that's going to eventually happen. There's a lot that can be done. Another big area is healthcare. We, we were the health state at one time. I don't know if we still qualify as the health state, but there's a lot that we can do to bring people here to get special kinds of specialized treatments and to learn about other alternatives to um, regular health care, um, to traditional health care. Can you clarify a little bit what you mean when you talk about airspace or aerospace? aerospace? Oh, well, I mean, at one time, the University of Hawaii had students who were sending small um, things up into the air um, uh, and and they were pretty successful that they kind of died out. And when I look at, you know, things that are, are happening on the mainland, things like the Branson's, uh, space tourism, and just the whole idea of the interest in outer space, which is really, I mean, it's a great deal of interest. When there's a, a rocket sent up or when there is a, a anything to do with space, 
all the kids are interested. My grandchildren love it. They'll get up at five o'clock in the morning to watch. All and right, I, thank I think, you. Um, we have two minutes left. Yeah, so I'm oh, give okay. You each one minute to answer this last <laughs> question. Uh, Marilyn, rising inflation is a problem across the nation. What is your plan to address it? Uh, it's, a, it's a big problem, and I don't know if uh, we can do, uh, from the point of view of Hawaii, if we can make it any, any better than it is. But I did read the report of Uhiro from the University of Hawaii, and they do feel that our economy will, might, might be doing better uh, if the recession comes in 2023 than that of the continent. And that's because our recovery started a little bit uh, later. And so hopefully that's true. But we, it, inflation is something that's affecting all aspects of the community. And, you know, it's, I go to the market and I, you know, I used to buy a steak, now I buy hamburger. And um, we got to get back to having uh, an economy where people can buy nutritious foods and be healthy. Thank you. And Lauren, just under a minute. What we need to do is eliminate the general excise tax on food and medical services. 41 of the states eliminate medical services tax. 37 of the states in America eliminate tax on food. It's not a revolutionary idea. It's something we should have done years ago, and it's something that will help people immediately. But if we eliminate the general excise tax, I'm afraid we won't have the revenue that's needed for things Aerospace. like education and um, some of our uh, social services. So it would be a huge decision to eliminate the general excise tax on food. A well, lot of you. the taxes come in from our tourists. Ah. Thank you ladies so much for joining us. And of course, um, to all of our Mililani residents for their great questions. We would like to thank our guests, the candidates for State House District 38, Marilyn Lee and Lauren Cheap Matsumoto. As we get ready for our next segment featuring State House District 6, please enjoy this Hikino story from Konawina High School. <laughs> On the big island of Hawaii, an organic farm is dedicated to helping abused, orphaned, and abandoned goats. We had a neighbor who brought us a baby goat in the bottom of a bucket and the dancing goat sanctuary was born. We had never met or worked with goats before and it captured all of our hearts here on the farm. And so Sarina, we give her credit for starting the dancing goat sanctuary. Starina became the first of many rescues at the sanctuary that has provided a safe environment where neglected animals can thrive. Some of our largest rescues have actually been um, from folks in the community who have been to the farm and they recognize when an animal is in need and needs help and they will give us a call and sometimes people just show up at the gate and um, we work with them to help them find a safe, secure place for the animals that often they care, they care very deeply for. Shauna Gunnarsson mentors youth in an after-school program called Kahana no Eo. The students learn about sustainability, self-determination, and how to treat animals compassionately. Good enough? Most of the goats here are pretty nice, as long as you don't trigger them by touching them on their uh, nose, because that, because when goats fight with their horns, they usually hit like right here and here. I want students to understand how their actions impact others. And with animals, we can see this very clearly because animals are very good about giving us feedback to our actions. So for example, when students come out to the farm and they're waving their arms and they're being very loud, the animals have a very obvious reaction to those loud noises and those uncontrolled actions. During my time on Miss Gunnarsson's farm, I discovered that my energy levels were way too high for the animals and sometimes the other people on the farm to cope with. Like whenever I would approach an animal, they would either scamper away or like leave the area slowly so as to not cause my energy levels to spike higher. That made me realize that sometimes you need to be calm and collected and disciplined in life in order to get what you wanted. And so that applies to all areas and that's what I learned from the farm. Students not only learn how to interact with animals, but that animals have social relationships that humans are not aware of. Visitors who spend time with the animals learn why animals have developed particular behaviors. 
someone, so they thought he was trying to be aggressive, but he wasn't. He just wanted to play. Mahatma Gandhi once said, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. The Dancing Goat Sanctuary emphasizes trust, understanding, and patience, setting a path for both animals and youth to build lasting connections. This is Xavier Chung from Konawina High School for Hiki No. Aloha and welcome back to Insights on PBS Hawaii. We are now joined by candidates for Hawaii State House District 6. Now this district includes Ho Nau Nau, Na Po'o O Po'o, Captain Cook, Kiala Kekua, Kea Ho, Ho Lua Loa, and Kailua Kona. So let's meet our guests tonight. Republican Jonathan Keneally is a graduate of Waiakea High School. He later joined the Army as a military police soldier and has also served as a federal police officer. Democrat Kirsten Kahaloa works at Ia Ole Stewardship Center. She recently worked as Portfolio Manager in Sustainable Industry Development over at Kamehameha Schools. So thank you so much for flying thank over you. to join us live yeah. in studio tonight. Thank you. Um, my first question, you know, talking about politics, a lot of people will talk about corruption and issues with trust. And so my first question for you is going to be, how are you gonna change people's view about your typical politician? I strongly feel, uh, well, first, I think, thank you for uh, inviting us uh, to this. I think that the, uh, the first thing is the people need to realize that we work for them. We are the employees of the people. Um, a lot of the politicians need to remember that. And I think that they've lost that mentality. Um, the way I would uh, approach this, and, and I'm going to, is by having a town hall. I would like to do it quarterly, but at least twice a year, where I can show the people of my district um, what I have done, the direction we're going or what we're working on and what we're trying to get done uh, in the near future. Get feedback from them, hear from them. If we're not doing something we're supposed to be doing um, or if something comes up, if there's a real issue, a real topic that they want to discuss, there's a lot of time in that, in those forums and town halls for that. So that's where I can hear back from the people. And Kirsten? Yeah, mahalo for having us. I think for public corruption, I think it's building trust. And I think as legislators and elected officials, connecting with community is a great way to do that. Like Jonathan said, we need to be present in our districts, but I think also legislation that was <clears throat> that's moving forward to ensure that campaign um, events aren't happening during session, I think that's a great way to move things forward and other opportunities to increase public trust like that. I think that's a great example of, let's see that moving forward and how that creates an impact and ensures that you know we have um, public trust. And I think just also ensuring that people get out and vote, that's part of, of helping elect the right elected officials for not just Kona community, but across the state. Get informed and vote, you have a voice. That's one way to build trust with your elected officials. And speaking of having a voice, our viewers do have an opportunity to voice their questions. You can call in, you can email us, or you can also post comments over on our Facebook page as well. If elected, you both would be first time uh, representatives in the House, uh, what would be you know, your target list of things that you would like to address? I think running for office, the exciting thing is I think all of us have really big lists of things we'd like to do and see. For me, I think there's great opportunities that the pandemic has shown us in agriculture and food systems. So ensuring that we're able to support our local farmers and our aggregators and our food hubs and really elevate our local food system. I think it's a great opportunity that our DOE and public schools also source locally as much as they can into our local cafeterias. I think there are great opportunities with the universal preschool to ensure that we use those funding and create opportunities so that every child in Hawaii has an opportunity to go to preschool and it's affordable and it's accessible in your community. Um, I could go on and on, but those are just some of the, I think, exciting opportunities that we have at the legislature. Jonathan? Well, like Kirsten said, we have a huge list and, and in all honesty, um, once elected, I mean, it's really what comes to us that we can work on. Um, it's really, I mean, we have a huge wish list and it's really what would come to us. But 
in that wish list, um, some of the main topics I think that we I would love to work on and focus on, in, especially in the beginning, would be yeah that corruption in government, uh, focusing on that, you know, it's a large overreach that's been had by. Uh, our government to the people and just really suffocating our people. So by pulling some of that off, allowing the people to breathe, um, cutting our taxation, uh, redesigning the tax laws here and, and the GET um, and economic uh, independence and it, it, even with the agricultural aspect of it, just overall economics of Hawaii, just so we're more independent in our uh, economics here in Hawaii. Why the decision to run this year? I think it's an exciting time. Um, I was able to be in a leadership program this mm -hmm. earlier this year that really motivated potential advocacy leaders in our community and emerging leaders to run for office. And the group and people I got to engage with are really inspiring young leaders in Hawaii and the opportunity to do this great work to impact community I think is important, but I think there, we're at a critical stage where cost of living is becoming insurmountable for a lot of families in Hawaii who are Native Hawaiian families, local families who've been here for generations and are making it, finding it hard to make ends meet. And I think that's something that um, is really important to me. I've seen family move away. I almost didn't come back after college what does it look like to ensure that local families can still live here is a high priority for me. And Jonathan, what was the catalyst for your decision to run? I think uh, a lot of it's the same thing. I mean, I think that we hear that echo amongst the people of Hawaii uh, over and over again. As a police officer at the airport, I see people packing their bags, I mean, just luggage upon luggage, and I, I stop them and I try to help them out, and I ask them, oh, you're going on vacation, and they're saying, no, we're moving to the mainland. And I see that every day, all the time. Um, when I came back home, after being gone for 20 years, I came back home a few years ago and take care of family uh, because of COVID and, and what was going on here in Hawaii. Um, I saw firsthand the, the devastation, the corruption, the overreach, the taxation, the um, even the mandates, what was what was happening to Hawaii, and it just broke my heart. Like I was just like torn by what what happened. And um, talking to a lot of the family and friends uh, about the situation, I I actually was uh, living in Texas previous to that, and I uh, I was like, I'm just going back to Texas. <laughs> it's just too too uh, overwhelming here, and so many family and friends just cried him just broke down and said hey please do something help us mm -hmm. we can't run for office we can't leave like you can we need change we need better all right well let's dig a little deeper and talk about your thoughts regarding tourism and your hope for how it's possibly managed or you know how are you impacted in your specific district well here in Kona as far as the Big Island goes uh, Kona actually receives a good majority of the the overall tourism for the island. Um, I would like to see more quality of tourism, not just quantity of tourism. Right now we bring in massive amounts of rental cars and then we don't know where to park them. So we bring in more rental cars because we rented them all out. And then we're getting congestion on the road and everywhere else. And looking back at it, we're looking at the cost and what we're spending into our tourism versus what we're bringing in in revenue for the our uh, our district specifically, and it's just not it's not worth it. the The amount of tourism that's coming in to, and the the damage to the roads, to the infrastructure, to everything else, to what we're getting is not there. I think we need a higher quality of tourism. Bring in um, just bring a better quality to what we provide to our tourists and stuff like that and actually because of that we can actually have a You're talking about quality. better quality of tourists like quality of people or the treatment? I think the I think all of the above I think that the treatment needs to be there um, we need to bring in more people from right now there's I, I have a lot of family and friends that uh, and people that work in Kona they're like oh I would vote for you but I live in Hilo they drive back and forth from Hilo to Kona to work in Kona, 
to provide that, that support and help in the hotels and the restaurants and so on and so forth, <coughs> but they can't afford to live in Kona, so they go back to Hilo, they drive back to Hilo. What I'm saying is by what we were talking about, sustainability in, in um, economics, it includes the, the housing issue that we have, a real, real problem that we have. Okay. And I, I know we're, we're going to talk about that topic. more. So let's jump over yeah. to Kirsten. Um, we're talking about tourism and your thoughts about how it's impacting your district and what kind of plan you would like to implement to either control it or, you know, your thoughts about well, that. Well, definitely in Kona, every resident feels the impact of the visitor industry. Again, like Jonathan said, we have a lot of hotels and resorts spread out across West Hawaii, so we feel it. Driving to the airport, Iron Man is in its last training stages, we feel it. But I think what's important is that we have leadership at Hawaii Tourism Authority and a CEO that lives and resides in Kona that is poised to focus on Malama Hawaii, focus on regenerative tourism. And I'd like to see Hawaii Tourism Authority having the time to execute their strategic plan that they initiated past the pandemic and see how we can allow a more regenerative form of tourism to happen and move into a way we're managing tourism in Hawaii and focus on getting tourism the type of tourism that we want to see in Hawaii. I actually had uh, Iron Man on my notes. <laughs> what are your thoughts about it returning? Um, we're excited to have Iron Man. I think it is somewhat part of the, the culture and custom. So to have it be gone for so long, again, we feel it. You see people training, the excitement builds. And so um, next week, that excitement explodes in the Iron Man world championships. I think there's a lot of concern in our community that I've been hearing about two days of the Ironman versus one. Mm -hmm. And businesses in certain areas are being shut down for two days instead of one. So I hear our community and I think that's one thing we want to address is maybe we need to keep it to one day. And Jonathan, your thoughts about the Ironman yeah. returning? Actually, that's exactly what we were talking about, what I was referring to when it comes to our tourism. Uh, Ironman, I live on Ali'i Drive, so I mean, I'm going to be either Directly stuck in my house, <laughs> yeah, they're going to close down the roads, or I have to leave. The um, When it comes to Iron Man, I think that it's awesome that we have it back here. Um, I'm really excited to see the effect it, it's going to have on our community, and I completely agree with with what Kirsten said as far as the bringing it to, keeping it at one day instead of splitting it to two days. And this is what I mean by that, that quality of tourism, you know, the what we're getting to what we're spending, and right now, putting it in two days, a lot of people are saying they can't handle two days of that. They can only really handle one. Some people have said that if you want to change the type of tourists that are coming, that we should add fees and additional taxes. What are your thoughts about that? Um, I would definitely be open to look at what they're talking about when it comes to that. Um, I don't think that that's beneficial overall. If there's a specific area where they're talking about, um, for example, growing up on the Hilo side, uh, we have uh, a Kaka Falls. And I used to go to Kaka <coughs> Falls all the time and go through the hiking trails and stuff like that. And I went back over there and yeah, you have to pay to park now and then you pay to go down into Kaka Falls if you're a tourist. If you're a local, you don't have to pay. And I thought that was kind of weird, but it made sense you know what I mean? You're putting a lot of money to keep up those trails and stuff like that. And this is how you re bring that back in. So, yeah, I do think that that's a great idea in some regards, specific to certain situations, but I wouldn't just blanket that to just everything. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about taxing tourists? You know, I'm really excited about the opportunity of fees at sites and those fees going back into maintaining those sites, like Diamond Head as an example. I think that's been a great opportunity that residents get to go for free locals get to go for free, but if you're a visitor, you have to pay and that then goes into the management of those sites. You know, in our communities, we're seeing Polo, uh, YPO Valley shut down temporarily and what that's done anecdotally is that more tourists are finding other locations to go and see. So they're going to Polo Valley and with no fee structure, you know, you know, in place, it just it kind of starts to impact those sites. And then what money goes back into ensuring that there's regeneration of those sites. So I think a fee system in that way might be helpful. Mm -hmm. But again, um, I, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, to ensure that our 
sites get stewarded and there's funding for those stewardship opportunities of those highly trafficked sites in Hawaii. So obviously something that impacts maybe more so the Hilo side, but obviously your island, the rapid Ohia death, um, you know, it's, it's making a major impact on agriculture and on uh, some of the community as well. What are some of the things that you would address to try to quell that situation? <clears throat> yeah, um, invasive species and molds or rat lungworm, you know, there's all these different things that are impacting our conservation efforts and our agricultural efforts and how we deal with them is actually pretty challenging. I think, how do we find ways to put more funding to some of those spaces? You know, a lot of ways to protect certain conservation sites are fencing. Fencing is highly costly because there's just all different kinds of human impact, but also ungulates that we have to look at as well. And I just think we need to do it we need to protect our native species, but we also need to work on reforesting and growing more of them. Not just ohia, but all of our native species, and in turn, that will protect our watersheds and our water sources. What are your thoughts about uh, invasive species and issues like rapid ohia death? That actually, yeah, I'm, for the most part, I, I think that that's, she, uh, Kirsten just hit that on the head. There's, there's so much right now that's coming in uh, that is, I mean, even just destroying everything, including what's going on with the amount of goats that we're bringing in, or that we're not bringing in, but letting just kind of run wild. They're just destroying a lot of things on the Mauna um, and across the island. Uh, talked to a lot of the farmers, and they've come up with, in some regards, uh, very natural remedies for their farms because of the fact that They've tried other different methods and they were told by different departments, you can't do this, you can't do that, you know what I mean, you have to make it like this. Or So they found natural rem remedies that have been working and I think that we need to have a hui between the these farmers and I know that, um, Kirsten, you've been working a little bit with, with that as well, talking with some of the farmers as well. I've heard some great, great things on this, but um, bringing these farmers together where they can share these remedies mm -hmm. that are natural remedies that's not going to invade what these different departments are saying they can and cannot do. I think we need to implement those. Piggybacking on your chat about farmers, we do have a question from a viewer. Do you have any ideas about providing affordable housing on ag lands for farmers? Yeah, actually there's a friend of mine um, right now uh, in Hawaiian beaches that spent $100,000 in uh, permits and fees and so on and so forth before he can even start building his house. Um, he actually built his house on an ag land area. They told him he can only build it on a certain amount of square footage and so on and so forth. Um, to some degree, I, I, I do respect the idea of making sure you're not going to just overwhelm your ag land with housing. I mean, that, make, that makes no sense. You just destroyed the, the purpose of ag land. However, uh, again, this overreach from government where they constantly are saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can only have, your garage has to be this big and, and so on and so forth is just outrageous and we need to pull back so from that. So you think that. it's outdated? Oh, way outdated, mm -hmm. way outdated. Kirsten, what are your thoughts about affordable housing for farmers? <clears throat> we gotta do it, we have to figure it out. I'm excited about the opportunity to figure out which ways we can allow and you know see if there's reforms to our land structuring to be able to put agricultural housing on on agricultural lands i'm in f i'm in favor of it and i think it's important we have an employment challenge in west hawaii but all across the state i believe but primarily when the visitor industry is doing hot it's hard for every other industry to hire people and ag is one of them and if there were housing that could be kind of that could that's a encouragement to get more agricultural workers and Kona has a great large vast agricultural community a lot of Kona coffee farmers so how we support them I think is really critical and we need to figure out how to make agricultural ha housing happen. Talk a little bit about homelessness is that something that you're seeing grow you know especially since COVID and and what the status is within your community? Yes, in West Hawaii and Kona, um, homelessness has always been a challenge. Our housing 
prices on our island are some of the highest in Kona and West Hawaii. So we do see homelessness and, you know, the county was in the works to provide more homelessness opportunities right before the pandemic. And so we haven't seen that come to fruition. So I think one thing I'm really passionate about is seeing that Village 9 or one of a new version of that or a model of that really comes to fruition and support our county and our mayor to make sure that that happens as a starting point. Jonathan, your thoughts? I think that um, in many ways, I think that there was, a, there was a lot of great ideas on paper and I don't think in action or when it was followed through that uh, anything really happened to benefit the, the, uh, the homelessness and the people of Hawaii. Um, I have some friends, uh, I had some relatives in the past that were homeless. Some of them passed away, some of them moved you know, elsewhere just because they couldn't afford a place to live here in Hawaii. Um, I believe in a hand up instead of a hand out method. So I believe in finding ways to get them back on their feet. What does it take to get them into a job? Get, you know, not just hand out food share or, you know, different options for them in this way, but, you know, hey, let's get you a job. Let's help you with that. And in the meantime, if we need to do this, give you these things, yes, let's do that. Let's get you into some sort of housing, um, better housing than, than what right now in Kona, what they're trying to provide. They're way too small and they're not really effective because we have a lot of families with kids who are homeless as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts about the traffic? <clears throat> you know, obviously this has been kind of a, a major situation for several years and it seems like it's going to be amplified coming up <laughs> soon as well. Um, but any kind of solutions or any thoughts of working with Department of <coughs> Transportation? Yeah, the, the, um, I would love to sit down with the Department of Transportation and, and conversate with them and talk to my uh, colleagues if elected on the floor as to what they've actually accomplished in, in Hawaii sometimes things just take forever to get through and we need to speed that up but one of the ideas that um, that was had amongst a good amount of the people in Hawaii is there's something called trackless trams it looks like a kind of looks like a train or like a bus that's connected like three times long and they're connected they they run on these magnets and it still has a driver and everything else um, on a road uh, just like a road lane, but you don't have a rail issue. You don't have to, you know, pay for all these rails everywhere and stuff like that. You just have a lane for this tram. Where would it go? Well, I would like to see a testing ground, uh, whether in here in Honolulu or if people are really touchy because of what's been going on with the rail system. <laughs> um, maybe, um, trying that in Hon or in Maui. Right now, Maui is starting to get congested as well. And I think that they would be open to maybe testing this. And if it works, maybe opening it up for more areas. And Kirsten, your thoughts about traffic and congestion? Yeah, um, you know, always an issue across the state, especially in Kona as well. We've seen traffic loosen with the expansion of lanes from Kona Airport to Kailua Town but that expansion is only right there in that corridor. We need to see that expansion go from Kailua now going south and up Mauka, but we do understand that those roads are much narrower, hard to get around, but I, I would love to work with DOT to figure out how we can have expanded and bypass roads in Kona, especially because that southern corridor from Kailua to up Mauka, that's where we get to the airport and not to have it Ex, an extra road when um, an ambulance vehicle is going past, everybody has to pull like over a on all sides. Yep, there's, there's no, there, it doesn't make it easy for any kind of ambulance to get safely from town where people live to the hospital currently. We are running short on time. We have a little under two minutes left, but uh, obviously you were impacted by a tropical storm back in 2014. Um, just real quick, what kind of natural disaster preparedness do you foresee you know, needed or necessary that you would wanna implement or discuss with lawmakers? Yeah, um, we are blessed to have Hualalai as a mountain that does do some protection. 2014 was a great example that we're not protected in all cases, but there's, there is that protection for some natural disasters 
The county does an excellent job with reminding people when it's time to prepare for natural disasters and how the state can help support and expand that I think is really important. We do need to know that we're in rural communities so the alarm systems that get tested to ensure that they are working so that in rural communities our community can hear them and be able to respond quickly. I think that's one of the safety issues to address in the immediate. Um, again, if there are natural disasters, roads and bypasses are critical. Jonathan, you just have like 30 seconds or so. No, it's okay. <laughs> I think that um, w with my background in federal law enforcement, I worked with FEMA and I've worked with other emergency management agencies um, and I would like to uh, redesign and uh, update, uh, we're way behind uh, the times with ours with Civil Defense and Hawaii Emergency Management Agency and I think we need to merge the two together providing f uh, better funding for Civil Defense in all the counties and everyone's on the same page and then we can actually because of that we can actually come up with some modern approaches to our emergency management. Thank you. Great conversation. Mahalo for joining us thank tonight you. and we would like to thank our guests. Candidates for House District 6, Jonathan Keneally and Kirsten Kahaloa. Now coming up next week we will feature candidates for two races for the State House District 13 and State House District 36. Please join us then. I'm Olena Hugh for insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha and ahui ho.